I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Superior Mayor Jim Payne is in the studio tonight to talk about the city's new smartphone app and other city news. We'll have a report on Community Action Duluth's Deep Winter Greenhouse providing valuable food for the community it serves. And blood donors are needed now more than ever as a blood emergency was declared this week by Memorial Blood Centers. We will have an update. Those stories and voices of the region coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac Nora. Thanks for watching. And Denny, it's great to be back after I had a few weeks off. I was wondering where you were, but you've been gone for a while. I was. Someplace welcome. tropical, but yeah. back to winter. Welcome back. <laughs> All Good right. to have you. Well, let's begin with that. All right. Lines. Thank you very much, Julie. Well, 6th Judicial District Court Judge Sally Tarnowski died tragically Monday while vacationing in Florida. Tarnowski was struck and killed by a motorist while she was out for a run. The 63-year-old Duluth native was a former chief judge and one of the longest tenured judges in the district. Also on Monday, former Duluth City Councilor Barb Russ passed away at the age of 74. Russ was elected to two four-year terms on the Duluth City Council, but resigned halfway through her second term in 2020 due to a cancer diagnosis. Prior to her time on the council, Russ spent 33 years with the St. Louis County Attorney's Office. Progress on the I-35 interchange project near downtown Duluth will mean some temporary traffic changes beginning next week. The southbound lanes of the interstate will close for about 10 days between Garfield Avenue and 27th Avenue West, with traffic switched over in a two-way configuration on the northbound lanes. The rerouting is needed for bridge girder installation and decking over the southbound lanes. And the Minnesota House of Representatives passed two bills this week that would bring nearly $2 billion of capital investments to the state. A $1.5 billion bonding bill and a nearly $400 million cash bill passed the House with bipartisan support. The measures move on now to the Senate and will await passage there before likely final negotiations occur in conference committee later this session. The City of Superior this week released a new smartphone app to help residents connect with city government. The app is free and it brings city services to the palm of your hand, according to a city news release. Here with more about that app and other city news is Jim Payne, the mayor of Superior. Welcome back, Mayor. Good to see you again. Uh, this is my favorite show. Happy to be back. <laughs> well, thank you very much. What uh, city services are available through this app, Mayor? All of them. The, uh, you can connect to anything we do at the city on that app and you can connect to it anytime. Mm -hmm. Such as? Uh, well, one of the top things is you can report a concern, uh, but uh, really just about anything that you might need to interact with the city about if you wanted to make a park reservation, if you wanted to track our plows, if you just want to keep up to date with government through our agendas or, or contact me or your city councilors, you can do all of that. So anything the website could do, anything uh, city staff can do, you can generally interact with and we can communicate back with you via the app. Really? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits from a city management standpoint? Uh, it puts us in closer touch to people in real time. So uh, a lot of the time people communicate with uh, the city uh, only when there's a big problem, when it's bothering them so much mm -hmm. that they remember to go home and give us a call. Uh, and, and we tend to lose the little day-to-day -day stuff. And so this lets us know how people are actually experiencing the city in real time. I hope it's a chance for them to uh, communicate maybe when they're not, when, it, when it's not a huge problem, but that everyday stuff so that we actually have a chance to fix yeah. it. Are mm -hmm. you starting to hear yet from Citizens Mayor? From the very first few minutes. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. How is this different from just the normal city website? In a lot of ways, it's, it's the same thing. It's all mm -hmm. the same content, except that it's with you. So uh, what I first noticed about it is that you know, it takes a while to get back to a computer to, to work on the, the city website. This is with you right away. So if you hit the pothole and you pull <laughs> over, you can let us know about it. Or if you come up with an idea at work, it's right there in your pocket in the palm of your hand. Uh -huh. In today's world, is it really an expectation that government is accessible on mobile devices? Absolutely. That's been my goal and my vision uh, uh, since I first ran for mayor. Uh, I, I'm the first mayor of Superior to really actively use social media. I've been trying to find as many different ways to communicate with the public as possible so that they can feel 
that it's their city, that they're on the inside and they can access all of our services and communicate with us what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And Mayor, we want to talk to you about some other things too. The former Husky Refinery will reopen this year. What do you say to residents who might fear what happened a few years ago? Uh, your fears are reasonable and justified. It was a very uh, serious emergency when that happened, but there have been a number of significant safety improvements, uh, a lot of third party governmental investigations with strong recommendations. And you should know that city administration, especially the fire department is paying very close attention to the rebuild and the mm -hmm. reopening and working closely with the refinery to make sure that the city is safe. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit before we went on the air that the Princess Theater is taking a lot of your time these days. The spring is a time for <laughs> big projects and I'm really, really excited about this one. We're moving mm -hmm. forward with uh, feasibility and design for that project. It's, it's going to take a while, but we're going to bring art and culture to Superior's downtown. Mm -hmm. What about some other things that are on the horizon that maybe people should be thinking about? Uh, the, the other thing that's really got me excited this spring is we are about to announce the first neighborhood for Superior's high-speed broadband network, and uh, that could be as early as the next two to three weeks. Now, we will be making a recommendation to committee and council, and, and I hope to bring the public into that conversation as well, but we're going to make the internet faster, more reliable, and more affordable in Superior. And Mayor, what a what effect has snow removal had on your city this winter? It's been a lot of snow this year, and it's not so much clearing it out of the streets. Our crew does a fantastic job of that, but it really does pile up on the side of the streets, and it gets pretty frustrating this time of year. Has all that hit the, uh, hurt the budget? No, we expanded our budget pretty dramatically, so uh, especially the overtime budget. So from the minute it starts snowing, we can start plowing. Mm -hmm. right. And the the snowplow tracker is on the is on the app. It sure is. You can follow those plows. At, uh, make sure go. they're out once it starts snowing. Wonderful, Superior Mayor Jim Payne. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. As winter drags on, the promise of spring seems just out of reach. While producer Megan McGarvey visited Community Action Duluth's innovative deep winter greenhouse to bring us a splash of spring color. We're in the deep winter greenhouse, which is managed by Community Action Duluth's Seeds of Success program. So this greenhouse operates pretty much mid-October through mid-April, so we're kind of on the downswing of the season now. Our peak production is early February, um, and we grow greens that go into our mobile market, our mobile grocery store. We are in the heart of Duluth, and we are in heart, the heart of a neighborhood that's considered a food desert. It can be hard to access fresh food. And you know, in Duluth, our growing season traditionally is pretty short, so this Deep Winter Greenhouse was a response to that. How do we keep the education and the good food going all through the winter? So this Deep Winter Greenhouse really fills that gap. Um, we're probably not going to get greens out of the garden until June, but we'll have these greens for five, six months over the winter. Originally this greenhouse was devised as a way to do some transitional employment. Um, since then it's evolved. Um, we're really focusing on food production that goes, like I said, to our mobile market. We also do education. We are right next to Denfeld High School, so we have a lot of plant sciences that come down, are excited to get out of class and get their hands in some dirt. Um, we also have other groups that come in. Uh, the University of Minnesota Extension was actually a, the originator of this design. So we have tours that come from Extension, from the colleges. It's really become an educational hub around this kind of growing because there's only like six or seven of these in the entire state of Minnesota. So we're growing stuff that is okay with sometimes eight, nine hours of sunlight that we get in like the depths of winter or the very cloudy days we get here in Duluth. So we have lettuce, we have a lot of brassicas, so that's the kale family, um, and a lot of Asian greens. So bok choy and its cousins really thrive in this low light environment. And it can get pretty cool in here overnight, so we need stuff that's hardy. So sometimes it can get down to 35, 40 degrees, and everyone in here is perfectly happy with that and will bounce right back. This is what's called a passive solar greenhouse. We don't have any additional light in here. If you were to go to a place where they're growing 
tomatoes or something indoors, they would have extra light. Tomatoes are really energetically expensive, but because we're growing all these little guys who are happy with the light that we can get for them just from the sun, just rely on the sun going over this southern facing wall. It comes in here, it heats up the concrete. In the summer, this space can be 130 degrees because it is so well oriented to the sun and so well insulated. Um, so in the winter, we benefit from that and it will consistently stay above freezing in here with, even without supplemental heat. The community mobile market, we call it a grocery store on wheels. So we really try and hit an entire diet in our little van. We pack it up and we drive mostly to senior living facilities, low ha housing income, a couple of trailer park communities, and we pop up in places that are considered low access and low income. So they may be far from a grocery store, they're more likely not to have transportation. So we're trying to bridge a gap for folks to get healthy food right into their community. Fresh greens can sometimes be seen as a luxury item. They can be very expensive. Some of, some of these greens are like the most nutritious things you can eat, especially grown in this organic soil. They are really, really good for you and can pack quite a nutritional punch. So we feel good getting them out, especially to our senior clients and our kids, and getting them to folks who might need a little bit more of that nutritional support. They're also just so delicious, and it's a joyful thing to be able to give them to folks and to invite people in here. It can be so therapeutic in the winter to have folks in here when it's all white and cold outside and it feels humid and moist and smells like soil in here. It's a really special experience. And I also just think it's important to understand where our food comes from. Um, it's a sacred thing to know where it comes from and to be able to relate to food in the way that you do when you've grown it yourself. Memorial Blood Centers this week declared a blood emergency as supplies of blood needed for transfusions and other medical needs reached critical lows. A combination of factors, including the COVID pandemic, have led to fewer people donating blood. Here with more is Angela Engblom, Senior Manager of Duluth Operations with Memorial Blood Centers, and Don Wickland is the Supervisor of the Transfusion Services Department at Essentia Health in Duluth. And welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting us. Angela, let's start with you. How unusual is it to declare a blood emergency? It's something that we try to not, we try very hard to not do this um, unless it's truly an emergency. Um, we don't want to like overuse, you know, a word and, and scare people, but this truly is a blood emergency. We actually have had less than a one day supply for some of our blood types. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we typically like to have a five to seven day supply. And Don, how many units of blood are needed on average in any given day here in Duluth? We use an average of 600 to 650 products a month, so anywhere from 15 to 30 products a day. A day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's driving the shortage? It's multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. It's, um, we've had a, well, we've talked about snow, you know, we've had a very snowy winter <laughs> and um, snowfall when people, when there's a lot of snow, people tend to want to stay indoors and kind of hibernate and not venture out. So we've had a lot of cancellations, people not doing blood because of the snow. Um, we've also had a really tough cold and flu season on top of COVID. Yeah. And so those are all reasons why people haven't been either able to donate or they haven't been, you know, able to get out to donate. Because so do of the you snow. think COVID maybe gave people kind of, a, I, I don't want to use an excuse, but kind of a habit of getting out of getting, giving blood. It definitely has actually. Um, we have had um, not as many people donating and some of our previous donors have not come back and started donating again post, post COVID. Mm -hmm. So that definitely has happened. So Don, how does it affect local hospitals like Essentia when there's not a robust supply of blood kind of waiting in the wings? Do, does it impact daily operations or when you use blood or how many lines people are allocated? <laughs> it, it can impact daily operations mm -hmm. if the if shortage were to get severe. Memorial Blood Centers has done an excellent job in, supp in supplying the blood products that we need for our patients. We've also uh, implemented some strategies to kind of lessen the amount of blood we use during those times when we're in a shortage area, like having physicians do more metrics in between units and making sure they're not over transfusing our patients. Mm -hmm. So at this point then, um, operations haven't really been impacted by this particular critical 
blood shortage or have they been? They have not, and uh, our patients haven't noticed any difference at all. We're still operating. Don, mm -hmm. what blood types are most critically needed? Type O. Type O is the type that we give to all of our trauma patients and emergency blood products when people come in and we don't know their blood type. So. When, when somebody gives blood, how long does a supply of blood last, uh, the, what you've donated? It's good on the shelf for 42 days for the red cell products. I see. Uh -huh. The plasma products are a little longer. So. Mm -hmm. Now for people out there who maybe have never donated blood before, Walk us through the process and what they can expect okay. because a lot of people have like needle fear uh -huh. and, yes. and you make it very easy. We do make it very easy. It's a very simple process. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can go to our website. There's a phone number they can call to see if there is any reason why they may not be eligible, but most, most population is eligible to donate. So kind of walking you through the process, um, you have an, mostly have an appointment. We do accept walk-ins at some blood drives and at the centers. And then um, you come in, you do a, an interview. We ask a bunch of um, health questions just to make sure that the donor is healthy and it's okay for them to give blood for themselves and also kind of a first screening process to make sure that their blood is okay to be given to another patient. And so we do kind of a, you know, a process for that and then we do a little mini physical, we check blood pressure, um, we take their temperature, their pulse, make sure that they are healthy. Um, everything passes and they go on to the donation process. So the beginning process takes maybe about 15 minutes and the actual donation process is typically less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you know, we do a little finger stick, um, and that's actually probably the worst of it. The actual <laughs> drawing of the blood in the arm is really nothing. It is just so easy, and our, and our staff, our phlebotomists are fabulous. They, if you're nervous about it, tell, tell the phlebotomist, I'm nervous. And they will talk to you, they'll be making you laugh, you won't even know what's going on, you won't even know they're getting a needle <laughs> in your arm. And so they make it a really enjoyable experience. I you understand. didn't even mention the, the best part, and that's that you get a snack afterwards. You get a snack <laughs> afterwards, and my favorite Lorna Dune cookies. So <laughs> yes, we have, we have that beverages. That alone makes it I know, the trip it does. Yes, it does. I understand there's an urgent need for platelet donors. What are platelets? Platelets, oh, do you want to talk about platelets? Sure, platelets are part of the blood products that actually go in and form a plug in when you have a cut or a scrape or an injury. When you see that scab on your skin, if you cut yourself, that's the platelets are helping to form that along with some other factors in the blood that are clotted factors and they make that plug to stop the patient from bleeding. So you can so. donate platelets without donating blood or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. You yes, can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> and Angela probably know more yes. about that. It's an apheresis procedure. It's an apheresis procedure. Yeah. So they would just basically take just um, take just the platelets and give you back your red cells and your plasma. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any statistics on just the the likelihood that most of our viewers themselves or someone they, that they know would need to have blood in their lifetime to just to talk about how common it is. It's, uh, it's extremely common. The last statistic I've heard is pretty much one in three people will, will need blood in their lifetime. So mm -hmm. that's you know, pretty high statistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is really life-saving stuff. It is, we have a number of patient populations that depend on that life-saving blood product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Northern News Now sponsored a blood drive this past week. Uh, what kind of success did they have? Were they able to bring in a lot of donors? We did have a very successful drive. Um, we didn't have as many donors as we had hoped to. We were a little bit under our goal. We were hoping to break the 200 mark over the two days. We got 182 units. You were close. So we were very close. Um, we did have some problems on Monday because we had a lot of cancellations because of the snow. And I mentioned that the snow has been an issue <laughs> for us this year. So, but it was very successful and that really has helped, but we're still at about a two day supply. Mm -hmm. So if an organization is interested in having a blood drive, do you mm -hmm. have some parameters as far as like how many employees they have to have or mm -hmm. how many people have to sign up in order to make it worth the while for the, the blood yes, mobile? To yes, yes, we do. Um, so the, the rule is, um, it's, the number of employees doesn't really matter, but we ask for at least 25 donors to mm -hmm. be signed up. Is and, kind of what we're asking for. And how do people go about doing that? Um, our website, memorialbloodcenternbc.org, and um, there's more information on that mm -hmm. on the website. And if people are just interested in making a donation, um, talk about the, the process for signing up or just walking okay. in. Okay, well you can sign up um, online on our website. Um, and it's, you can literally search for, um, for blood drives. You can put the zip code of your area that you're in. Put the zip code in, you can select you want to donate at a blood mobile or you want to donate at a blood center. We have donor centers in Superior, in Hibbing, Virginia, and here at the Duluth site. 
And so you can actually put in and it'll search and show you like all of your availabilities, all the places you could donate blood. And then you select them and you click and you okay. select a time. All right. It's sounds, super easy. Very good. Sounds super great. Easy. Well, thank you so much, ladies. And I hope that this uh, gets the message out there and spurs some people to donate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both you. very thank much. You. Thank right. you. It's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from an area journalist about stories in the news. Our guest this week is Danielle Kading, a reporter with Wisconsin Public Radio. So in Wisconsin, Governor Tony Evers' proposed budget is calling for the state to invest $750 million in broadband expansion, and that would be over the next decade. And this is coinciding with the state um, possibly receiving more than $1 billion from the federal government. Um, that money is part of funding that is provided through a grant program under the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so even though we're going to see a tremendous infusion of federal money, um, state leaders are saying that we still need uh, to have state funding as a backstop to ensure that everyone has access to high-speed internet. And part of the reason for that is the maps, the new broadband maps released late last year by the Federal Communications Commission. Um, these maps will determine who lacks high-speed internet and the underserved areas that would qualify for billions of dollars in funding nationwide. This is why the state is saying that we need um, some state funding to fill those gaps because they know that the information that's reflected in the federal maps is not accurate with information they have at the state level. And that's also important to Northern Wisconsin leaders, and particularly in Superior. You know, they want to see um, the most accurate information reported because they're in the process of building out their own fiber optic network. And that's supposed to cost more than $50 million. And the goal of city officials is to lower internet costs for residents and increase speeds and reliability of service. Another item that Governor Tony Evers is proposing to fund that would benefit Northern Wisconsin um, is the Blotnick Bridge Replacement Project. Um, Governor Tony Evers is suggesting um, to use about $47 million in bonding to begin work on the reconstruction project. Um, and funding for its replacement requires approval from the Wisconsin legislature as a major interstate bridge project. So in order to move forward, transportation officials in the state say the project would require funding over multiple budgets, and this is part of that. Um, and as you know, the Blotnick Bridge between Duluth and Superior is estimated to cost $1.8 billion, and Wisconsin's Transportation Secretary Secretary Craig Thompson says this is the biggest project um, that the state has coming up um, in terms of cost. The Wisconsin and Minnesota Departments of Transportation are considering two options now. Um, one would be to reconstruct the bridge along its existing route, and the second would be slightly westward across the St. Louis River. And um, they expect to announce their preferred alternative in March for um, whatever option they decide for replacing the bridge. Construction of it is slated to begin in 2028, but it could begin in 2026 if funding becomes available. And Wisconsin and Minnesota are applying for $800 million in grant money under the bipartisan infrastructure law to help fund this project. And they hope that federal funds will pay for the vast majority of that work. Everyone knows about harmful algal blooms, and we've all heard for a long time that rising temperatures favor the growth of these types of blooms. But there was a new study recently that found increasing evidence that they also form in cold and even ice-covered conditions. And this is part of research that was done with a team of more than two dozen scientists, and it was recently published in the peer-reviewed scientific journal, Limnology and Oceanography Letters. And um, it was spearheaded. Uh, the study's lead author is from the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve. Caitlin Reinel said uh, they 
this team of scientists, they looked at papers, data, news reports, and observations of cold water blooms, and they identified 37 of these cold water cyanobacteria blooms. And cyanobacteria, which is often referred to as blue-green algae, has the ability to produce toxins that can make people or their pets sick. Um, and so, you know, while we've all been told that the recipe for blooms to form is kind of, you know, high temperatures and a lot of nutrients, um, that's true in a lot of cases, but not all. And there are blooms that occur in these um, lower nutrient conditions and in these uh, lower temperature conditions. Oh, Denny, it looks like we're in for a snowy weekend. I didn't. I thought we were done at that point, <laughs> but winter's not done with us yet, yet, and neither is the show. We so. have uh, <laughs> we have more snow this weekend. So if you're a snow lover, get out and enjoy. All right, All right. for Dennis Anderson and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.